Into a drawer went a reel of tape. It could have elected a man president, or it could have just made him look foolish. We'll never know. We'll get to that unused reel of tape, but first, talk about foolish. Nine score and twelve years ago, which is 1840, nine score and twelve years ago, the Whig Party chose their candidate. And upon hearing that the Whig Party had chosen William Henry Harrison as their presidential nominee, the Democrats, those who were hoping for the re-election of President Martin Van Buren, were jubilant. An old man who last fought a battle against the Indians 28 years ago? At 67, he'd be the oldest president ever. Washington retired at 65 after two terms. Giddy, the Baltimore Republican newspaper, which, just to confuse you, was a Democratic newspaper, printed an attack. Why, Harrison, they said. Just give him a pension worth 2000 a barrel of hard cider, and he'll sit in a log cabin wasting the time drinking all day. In other words, he was feeble, too feeble to be the chief magistrate. That uh, didn't work too well for President Van Buren. The Whigs had some serious campaign minds in their effort. Henry Clay of Kentucky, Thurlow Weed of New York. They saw the way to respond immediately. Forget, of course, that William Henry Harrison was the descendant of Virginia aristocracy, the descendant of a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and that he grew up in a mansion. Forget all that. As far as voters needed to know, he was born in a log cabin, just like the opponent said. And if it made him president... Just say he built it with his bare hands, by God. The New York Daily Whig countered. They think that a poor man who lives in a log cabin cannot be president of the United States. And the issue was born. So what if our man was a hard cider drinker? That's what Americans drink. What did President Van Buren drink, then? Champagne? That's right, he did. And so... It began. In every Whig rally, there would be a log cabin of some form, maybe a little wooden trinket, maybe a larger model that you could see on a table, or one that you could mount onto a pole in your parade, or even a real log cabin that you could walk into and hear about how great the Whigs would be if they got into the White House. All while you were served hard cider, and plenty of it, perhaps served in a tippecanoe cup celebrating the battle of the Indian Wars prior to the War of 1812 that, at least the Whigs said, was a complete victory. There was debate about that, actually, about Harrison's role in it, but no matter. To man the ship, the Whigs said, we'll take old tip. In New York, newspaper editor Horace Greeley attacked the president, Van Buren, and saluted old tip. In Illinois, the ablest lawyer in Springfield, Abraham Lincoln, stumped the state, supporting Harrison as a Whig presidential elector, urging voters to create a bank of the United States for the common man to get credit. Oh, but it couldn't be all business. You needed songs, too. Tip a canoe and Tyler to sheet music was sent around the country, a way of getting the word out about the ticket and working in the name of the vice presidential candidate, John Tyler. Tip a canoe and Tyler, too, a recent convert to the Whig cause and picked mostly to win Virginia. There were other songs, too. The Grand Log Cabin March, the Tip a canoe Quick Step, it was a ceaseless torrent of music, one Democrat said, after the election. I'll never forget those songs. If a Democrat tried to speak about separating banks from the state or some important issue facing the nation, it was met with singing. Now, prior to this election, only two incumbent presidents had been defeated. John Adams and his son, John Quincy. Four presidents had been re-elected. Two-thirds. So an incumbent president was strong, and Van Buren controlled the White House patronage, a New York political machine, and had the backing of popular former president Andrew Jackson. In 1836, when Whigs tried to run four candidates against Van Buren and throw the election to the House of Representatives to win, he beat them decisively. So Van Buren was strong, yet he had some problems. The panic of 1837 gripped the country. It was severe. Banks and businesses were ruined and it hadn't gotten quite better by the time of his election year. 
Plus, he was struggling to hold his party together. Agitations at this time, 20 years before the Civil War, were strong. And as a New Yorker, every time Van Buren reached out to the Southerners, he would need to win re-election, or even renomination. He hurt himself with abolitionists in his home state. This particularly hit home when the slave ship Amistad crashed on American shores and slaves asked for their freedom. But it was a Spanish ship. By treaty had to be returned. Van Buren was in a pickle. If he gave the ship back to the Spanish per the treaty requirements, he made Southerners happy. If he allowed them into the United States, he would make abolitionists happy and anger Southerners. So he kicked the issue to the courts. And he felt that if he just allowed a trial, people would salute him. Actually, it angered both sides of his fragile coalition. In Pennsylvania, he had the governor, David Rittenhouse Porter, who, although a Democrat, was for paper money and high tariffs, anti-positions of the administration, who compromised from time to time with Whigs, and split the Democratic Party in Pennsylvania. Despite the efforts of peacemaker James Buchanan to patch up the two sides, he did get one of Porter's judges appointed by President Van Buren and did get Porter to make some positive statements about Van Buren, the state was still deeply divided. But when Democrats got united and tried some messages, Whigs turned everything around. Less talk, more cider, they screamed. They took the president's nickname, OK, old Kinderhook, and reversed it to say he will be KO'd. They sang, Van is a used up man. The Democrats eventually tried to respond to this silliness serving dark ale and calling themselves Porter Bottle Democrats. They made fun of supporters of Old Tip. They called them Tipplers, all right. They might tip over. Look at Harrison's last name, they said. Backwards, it was No Sirrah. It was funny, and it does kind of demonstrate how politics was then and put some perspective on politics today, but that didn't catch on like the Whig slogans did. And their sheet music just wasn't as catchy. One observer predicted, soon each party will behave like a circus, with marching bands of music, dancing folks, clowns with pink noses, and lofty tumbling. More people were participating in that circus than ever before. The 1830s saw legislation in many states that brought about an increase in popular voting. 2.4 million people would vote in that 1840 election, more than ever. And when it came to the choice of the challenging candidate, it's not so much who the Whig party ran that the thirsty voters took a liking to, but it's also who they did not run. They didn't run Daniel Webster, the Massachusetts orator. He was too offensive to Southern Whigs. They didn't run, though every inch of his body ached for it. They didn't run Henry Clay. He had lost in 1832 and made a few enemies in a speech in the House attacking abolitionists for causing so much trouble and compromising with Southerners, but also making compromises that Southerners didn't like. And there was that stint as Secretary of State under John Quincy Adams, which many felt was manipulative and a corrupt bargain made him look less than the most popular of the Whigs or the Patriot Party. Harrison had obtained the most votes of three candidates running in 1836, and he had no role in government, thus he could not be blamed for anything like that Panic of 37 that happened in Washington. Indeed, Nicholas Biddle, former Bank of the United States president, thought that Harrison was great because, well... He had no connection to him, to Biddle, or his bank. Finding someone who had not been financed by Biddle at all was hard to find in American Whiggery. But Biddle did advise that old Tip should not say one word about his principles or his creed. Very modern type advice, right? Let the use of ink be wholly prohibited, he said, as if he were the mad poet of Bedlam. Well, the Van Puren supporters started to pick up on this little trick, and they attacked candidate Harrison now as the silent man. General Mum, they called him, the man in the iron cage. These attacks by the Van Buren folks did start to cut a bit. So the Whigs decided to open up their candidate. They let Harrison do a stump campaign. Of course, he kept it to audiences that were friendly and his speeches were on very general topics. Now the Democrats attacked him for doing this. How uncouth. A man taking the stump for the presidency, speaking on his own behalf? 
These attacks were contradictory, and they didn't really work. Voters agreed with putting the ship in the hands of Old Tip. 22 states said so. Whigs captured Virginia, New York, Pennsylvania, which had been solid Jacksonian and Van Buren states previously. Now they went to the Whigs. Harrison was president. All of the questions raised by this election where a sitting incumbent was defeated are present in today's politics. Another election, 2012, where a sitting president is up for election. What does a challenger do? Does the challenging candidate hide and let a president sink himself? Stay quiet. Keep conversations general. Or does he take a forceful stand and slice the opposing party with a true vision? Is a president like Van Buren caught in a bad economy or political turmoil simply doomed? Does the challenger in these contests even matter? Despite the years 1840 to 2012, 172 years, one thing's the same. 1840 made it two out of six presidents who sought re-election lose, and that ratio is just about the same today. Only 10 men have beaten an incumbent president. Nine in an original challenge, and one, Grover Cleveland, in a comeback after having been defeated himself. The lesson there might be it's not so easy to be one of the men who have beaten a sitting president. Yet, as Leadership 80 soared above the California coast, those on the campaign plane of Governor Ronald Reagan knew that he would be one of these successful challengers. It was a day before the election, but there was no doubt. Indeed, as Air Force One would bring the president to his hometown of Plains, Georgia, Jimmy Carter knew that he would lose as well. It was only a question of by how much. He was trailing 11 points in the polls. In October, there had been some sparks of hope as the economy seemed to improve from the twin recession of 79 and 80, and that maybe back-channel negotiations would be successful and the president could march in front of cameras, greeting the American hostages returned from Iran, which had been a black eye for American prestige. He wrote in his diary on October 13th that advisor Hamilton Jordan had a positive assessment of his comeback chances. Ham gave me an election assessment that looks good. On October 16th, he wrote, Housing starts are up. GNP is up. I think the recession is over. It was a hasty assessment. Unemployment up a point from 1979's rate. Then, October 24th, he wrote, Ham reports upward poll results in Florida. Bad feeling, though, about 1% inflation increase last month. The Iranians are making noises, but I think they are playing with us. Indeed, the hints in Carter's diary were correct, despite multiple meetings with envoys, speculation about the seriousness of the Iranian parliament and religious leaders. No progress would be made while he was president. Only 36% of people thought that Carter would get the hostages back. Months ago, it had been over 50%. His pollster told him bad news. He was losing Catholics. He was losing union workers, the people that had gotten him elected. A primary challenge from Ted Kennedy forced him to spend time chasing Democratic base voters. A third-party challenge from Anderson featuring a VP candidate who had supported Kennedy was still drawing liberal voters. I don't have time to woo Midwest farmers or Southerners, Jimmy Carter said. I was spending too much time chasing traditional constituencies. The hostage crisis demanded precious time, too. By and large, the American people would reject Jimmy Carter two to one. That wasn't an ad from the Republicans. That was his own pollster, Pat Cadell. But the White House re-election team also faced a strong opposition in 1980. When he won in 1976, Carter had exploited the division between Reagan and President Ford in a bloody nomination fight. Now in 1980, there was only an insignificant few primaries between George H.W. Bush and Reagan. Yes, George H.W. Bush surprised Reagan in Iowa, but Reagan won New Hampshire, and the party quickly rallied behind the former California governor. And the party selected Bush to be the vice presidential running mate, a unified convention. Reagan came out storming, taking advantage of Carter's weaknesses, appearing in places blue-collar voters would live, places the president badly needed in order to win re-election. Places where his primary fight with Kennedy had hurt. In New York City, at the construction of a subway tunnel, he accepted the cheers of hard hats, who unfurled a banner that said, Free the hostages. 
on to City Hall in Patterson, New Jersey, where he said the president had failed working people, that the government had so much fat that it could be used to make soap. At a stop in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, a mining area, he attacked the president on his economic numbers. President Carter tells us that the average unemployment rate is 8%. That reminds me of a story of a fellow trying to cross a river. He was told the average depth of the crossing was three feet. But when he got to the middle, he drowned. Now, in the days of YouTube and cable, one might have been aware that these entrees into blue-collar democratic states was met with a few problems, jeering, negative banners. At the City Hall in Patterson, there was some profanity. At Wilkes-Barre, there was a large woman's protest against Reagan. But in the era of 6 o'clock, 7 o'clock news, Reagan had mastered the art of that soundbite that would be all that would be heard in addition to background images of the candidate. All TV viewers would see was the 30-second clip. Him waving, saying his line, more waving. Film at 11. All over the nation, he pounded the message home. The economy was bad. Carter was ineffective. They tell me I'm not supposed to use the word depression. My friends, I've heard it said that a recession is when your friend loses their job. A depression is when you lose your job, and relief is when Jimmy Carter loses his. But it wasn't all fun and games on Leadership 80. Carter's team and the president himself was striking back. And in the words of Carter's pollster, Pat Cadell, the strategy was clear. It was, get Reagan. Hint that he was racist, as was done when the president said that uh, Reagan was using coded words, such as states' rights in the campaign. Hint that his policies of expected confrontation with the Soviets would start a nuclear war. Women outvoted men in the 1976 election. Now, in 1980, maybe the president could earn them back, with concern and worry over this outspoken Republican candidate. According to Michael Deaver, longtime Reagan advisor, there was another concern in Reagan's 80 campaign. At any time, despite Governor Reagan's lead, the president could assert his Rose Garden option by changing events, especially if there was a deal with the hostages and the president would be appearing with those rescued hostages, the October surprise. If that happened, they might lose the lead and the reason behind the Reagan challenge. Carter would not appear as inept as he had. Extra campaign dollars were banked for those last few days in the campaign in case of such an event. The Republicans of 1980 then faced the same question in a form that the Whigs of 1840 faced, whether or not to open up their candidate. Now, this wasn't about stumping. Reagan was out there stumping all over the country, but it was about whether to participate in a TV debate. You didn't necessarily have to. See, 1960 you had debates, 1976 you had debates, but you didn't have a presidential TV debate in 64, you didn't have one in 68, you didn't have one in 72. So it wasn't exactly precedent for this. Reagan might have been able to ditch a presidential debate and just sort of sit on his lead. Carter's campaign and the League of Women's Voters wanted a few debates. Reagan's team stalled, and they said they'd only do so if third-party candidate John Anderson was allowed in the debate. In fact, Reagan went on to debate John Anderson alone. Carter, not wanting to face two challengers, refused that. Carter's team offered one debate instead of several, but no Anderson. They were insistent on that. Reagan's team was forced to question, should they hold on to their lead or give Carter a possible chance to score points and add to the doubts about the candidate? Reagan's team, including Governor Reagan himself and his wife, Nancy, wanted to debate. And indeed, the candidates debated on October 28th, less than a week before Election Day, Carter wrote in his diary afterwards. Hard to know what effect the debate will have. Reagan was all shucks. I'm a grandfather, and I'll never take this nation to war. He has memorized tapes. He pushed a button, and they come out. But for most commentators on the 1980 election, looking back, there was no doubt that debate had sunk Carter or at least extended the amount of states that Reagan would win by. Reagan had carried the debate, most observers' eyes, parrying Carter's blows about his warmongerness and presenting the president as inept. Carter bungled in an attempt to focus the election on a different issue from his own performance, on the potential nuclear war with a new Republican candidate as president, using an answer from his own daughter. He had asked his daughter Amy what the most important issue of the election was. His daughter said nuclear war. It was roundly made fun of by the Reagan team and by the media. Reagan asked a decisive question which matched what was on voters' minds. 
Do you feel better economically than you did four years ago? The answer of voters in all but five states in the District of Columbia was no. And the debate gave Reagan a larger lead in that, and also the Anderson third party may have magnified how bad Carter's loss was. Far from an October surprise, the Iranians held the hostages until the day Carter was out of office. The election was a blowout. We never got the chance to see any kind of comeback. Reagan's example is one that many commenters refer to as the way to beat a president. Thomas Sowell, for instance, says Reagan is the example. Only Republican to beat a sitting Democrat in the 20th century of a strong, decisive message. Confidence. Forcing the question. Dare we say if 1840 was the best challenger campaign of the 19th century, 1980 was the best of the 20th. But was it the role of Reagan that was decisive here? Did Carter lose it rather than Reagan win? Carter's approval was 37%. Inflation was high. Unemployment was high, although not as high as the 2012 rate. What if somehow George H.W. Bush had bested Reagan in the 1980 primaries, right, after his stunning win in Iowa? What if he became the nominee instead of Reagan? What if John Connolly won South Carolina and then beat Reagan in the primaries? Or some other nameless person? What if one of these people who would have to introduce themselves to the electorate as they were still winning over their party. Hypotheticals are always difficult, and difficult questions follow. Could anyone have beaten President Carter? Was it so easy that it didn't matter? Did Reagan make it a landslide where another candidate might have fumbled enough to give Carter a chance to come back? Did a professional actor with a strong sense of purpose, a message, and a unified party keep re-election out of reach? Would George H.W. Bush or John Connolly as candidates been able to beat the incumbent? Or conversely, did Reagan, who had a conservative image and scared some moderates, actually give Carter the best chance of any to win? It's just that Carter's political skills were deficient, and he could not capitalize on it. You could ask a myriad hypotheticals about 1980 in many ways. But to this question of what an upstart challenger might have done, some clue might be found in the election that happened four years before it, when Carter was not now the president, but when he was the challenger challenging an incumbent president, Gerald Ford. He bested the contenders in the Democratic Party, Scoop Jackson, Mo Udall, Ed Muskie, and off a unified convention in 76, hit a 20-point lead against President Ford. The economy was charging at a groovy 5%. Inflation was high, but not as high as it had been. Gerald Ford was an unelected president and less popular after pardoning Nixon for any and all crimes he might have committed. Yet Carter spent the summer and fall campaign that general election watching as his lead slipped away from 54 to 36 in the polls to 50-42, 48-42, 47-41, a series of gaffes was doing him in as a candidate. First, he told the AP that the rich should pay more in taxes. But when pressed, he said that the rich was more than the median income. Well, in 1976, the reporter said that was 12000 a year. So are you saying, candidate Carter, that you'd charge more taxes on people making 15000 Worse, the AP copy cut out when it was uh, released, a point where Carter said he'd give a break to the middle and lower classes that blunder on the policy front was joined with a heavy blunder on the social policy front, as candidate Carter did an interview with Playboy, an attempt to make him seem a little hip. He didn't notice, according to his account, the tape recorder was still running, or at least felt he was in a conversational portion with the reporter that wouldn't be used when he said, The Baptist Church does not hold dominion over me. I'm human and I'm tempted. Anyone who lusts after women has committed adultery in their heart. I've looked at a lot of women with lust. It got worse as the interview went on. This interview with Playboy hurt his southern base. Religious voters carry the day. Then in the first debate, Carter didn't perform as well as expected, and Ford seemed to carry the day. Confidence built up in the Ford camp. I'm an underdog, but a slight one, Ford said. The polls got very tight, to the point that there were more undecideds than the margin between the two candidates. Ford made a gaffe in the second debate saying Eastern Europe was not dominated by the Soviet Union. Then his agriculture secretary, Earl Butts, said racist comments, very racist comments to a magazine. And the campaigns were tied, each with their own little gaffes. 
The Ford campaign, one might say, threw the ball in the air. He left the Rose Garden strategy he had been pursuing and started touring states. Knowing that the end of race would be close and that Carter may have spent all his money, he had banked $4 million to bombard the airwaves in the final days with ads and a smiling, happy American singing that they're feeling good in America. Pictures of Ford calmly in the Oval Office. In the last days of the campaign, sportscaster and game show host Joe Garagiola set up commercials with a kind of fake talk show format designed to make Ford look more like a regular guy with this former baseball player, former St. Louis Cardinal. He lobs softballs to the president. Mr. President, Americans are concerned about higher taxes. What will you do for them? Mr. President, how many foreign leaders have you met? Hundreds of leaders, Joe. Mr. President, how is your administration different from Nixon? They called it the Jerry and Joe Show, and it worked very well, so well, that they had Gary Giola accompanying the president everywhere he went in the final days up until the moment of elections where Joe and Jerry were watching the returns. But there was one weapon that they didn't use in this last-minute blitz. One aide came up with a novel idea to break the stalemate. Earlier in the campaign at a rally, someone, a prankster, had thrown a cherry bomb into the crowd while Ford was speaking. While the crowd was shaken, Ford stood resolute and then went on with his speech. They could use this in an ad to show the president's leadership in a time of Watergate and political turmoil, you know, that still have the, the 60s fresh in your mind in 1976. But that's not all. The ad would fade into another image. Ford had campaigned in Dallas and insisted on riding the same route as JFK had with the top down in his limo. Secret Service wasn't happy about that. The narrator's voice running the video from this trip would say, once again, the president can be close to the people. When a president can ride in Dallas again, it is a new America. At least according to the aide that designed the ad, that was the psychological message that could have pushed the election to Ford. Stability in a rough time. But the Ford campaign aides, Bob Teeter, Jim Baker, Dick Cheney, didn't like the ad. They ran it by a Focus group, just to test it, the focus group was a bit freaked out by it. The overwhelming reason they didn't run it, Jim Baker said, we'll lose Texas because of the reference to Dallas in the ad. The ad was pulled. In the last few weeks, Carter hired Tony Schwartz, the creator of the infamous Daisy ad of LBJ's 1964 campaign. And he designed a few devastating ads to attack Gerald Ford. One was about Gerald Ford's resume, which, of course, listed all the bad things that he had done. Carter, though, refused to run the ad. He decided not to run negative TV ads. And instead, Carter appeared in the final days in a dark blue suit, looking right into the camera and talking about the tax code. Schwartz made those ads, but his heart wasn't in it. After the campaign, he described his client and the client's staff as timid and responsible for the closeness of the 1976 general election. Carter won the election, he said, but he lost the campaign. Yet Carter did win the 1976 election and take the keys to the White House, albeit with 50.1% of the vote. Ford's last-minute strike had earned him New Jersey, Illinois, California states that Carter's team were counting on. Only Carter's home region, the South, had saved him in that general election from his slide. So here we have it. In 1980 and 1976, you got two different elections, both with a challenger won. We've seen an election with a skilled challenger who won, and an election with a somewhat fumbling challenger who also won. Every election's a little different, so we hunger for more examples. President Adams had had enough. It was time for the executive to do a little house cleaning. John Adams was known for his temper, known to friends, exaggerated by enemies. But on one day, in the year of his re-election, his anger was shown, reserved for his Secretary of War, Mr. James McHenry. He stormed in and began verbal abuse. McHenry would tell to his friend Alexander Hamilton, as if I had done nothing right. I had bought shoddy clothes for the troops. I had conspired to help make Hamilton commander of the armies against his wishes. 
Then the president finished his harangue. Washington saddled me with three secretaries who would control me, but I will see to that, he demanded McHenry's resignation, and he got it. And he fired off a note to Thomas Pickering, the Secretary of State, who Adams called the man in the mask, loyal not to the nation's president he served, but to that but intriguer and that son of a Scottish peddler, Hamilton, who through his influence on politics was acting as if he were the head of the government, not Adams. In a letter, Adams demanded that Pickering resign. Pickering responded, I do not think I'm inclined to do that. Adams' next letter fired him. John Marshall, loyal to Adams, was brought in as Secretary of State. Third secretary that Adams didn't like, Oliver Wolcott, though a Hamilton ally, was allowed to stay because he had, Adams felt, at least done his job well. He told friends that Adams complained that there was a British faction in the American government being led by Hamilton and accused Wolcott, McHenry, and Pickering as being part of it. This was no Saturday night massacre. It was not just a rash move, however. Two years prior, diplomatic negotiations with France were tense. France was seizing American ships, refusing our goods, safe passage. They were angry over the Jay Treaty we had signed with England, and angry that we did not honor the Franco-American Treaty of 1778. The U.S. position was that that agreement was something done at the time of the Revolution when there was a king of France, and the agreement was with the king of France. After the French Revolution and the, the death of the king, that agreement was void. The French, led by a directory revolutionary government, did not like this. And when we sent over three commissioners to deal with them, they were rebuffed and told they would have to pay a tribute to France to even begin negotiations. Famously, they responded, no, not one penny for tribute, millions for defense, but not one penny for tribute. This was known as the XYZ affair, named after the French ministers who could not be named. The U.S. armed itself. Adams and Congress created a provisional army with George Washington as his ceremonial head. Much to Adams' chagrin, Washington turned around and put Hamilton in as commander effectively. A quasi-war on the high seas began between French and American ships. For a short while, Adams and the Federalist Party enjoyed a popular rally. Hamilton liked this and wanted it to continue. But John Adams wanted peace with France, and when he sent a peace mission, his party revolted. Hamilton hitched a plot to be sure that Adams was not elected in 1800. In 1800, inter-party warfare began. To Hamilton, beating Adams was more important now even if a member of the opposition party got elected. If an enemy is to be head of state, he told a friend, I'd rather it be someone we do not have to be responsible for. This was 1800. Washington had died the previous year, and now politics in the organ that had supported his administration, the Federalist Party, became, according to Fisher Ames, a Massachusetts congressman, more complicated than the underplot of a Spanish play. The Federalists held a caucus of about 30 congressmen, and this is how you picked candidates in early America before conventions, and decided that when the election came up, they would do something that appeared to support President Adams, but really did not. They would vote for both Adams and Charles Coatsworth Pickney. This is prior, you see, to the 12th Amendment. You voted for two people. Ostensibly, you wanted one to become president and the other to become vice president. The Constitution wasn't clear on how that was to happen. It wasn't a party-friendly document. The Constitution really did not consider parties or want to consider it, so vote dropping became the way. In other words, if you want one member of your party to become vice president and the other president, you just have to have one elector somewhere to cast his second vote for someone else. And that way, the presidential candidate will have the highest amount of votes. Maybe a negligible favorite son candidate or, or someone else will not affect the outcome. So the right guy becomes president. Well, this immediately did not work well and people were betrayed by the time you got even to the first competitive election. Aaron Burr, running ostensibly for vice president in 1796, that was what was agreed on by the Republican Party, anti-administration party at the time, lost the Virginia electors. And had Jefferson won the presidency in 1796, Burr would not have been as vice president. And that's because so many of the Virginians and others dropped Burr and voted for someone else to be sure that Jefferson and not Burr would win. 
Now Hamilton wanted a few of his Federalist allies to do the same thing that was done to Burr. Those that were angry with Adams would drop a vote for Adams and vote for Charles Coatsworth Pickney. But publicly, no one would dare to say this, so they all had to support the Federalist Party caucus and say, please vote for both Adams and Charles Coatsworth Pickney, hoping that they would get an equal amount of votes and you would get to the South Carolina electors where Charles Coatsworth was a favorite son and they would take care of the majority vote there. But ostensibly, the caucus was to vote, every Federalist elector was to vote for both Adams and Pickney. Sounds nice. No vote dropping on either side. Except Adams could be rightly met. He was president, and why should he not be the favored one? This will split the Federal Party into Adams, one congressman, Samuel Dexter of Massachusetts, rightly predicted after that caucus. Something else happened that assisted with the split in the party and John Adams' anger. In New York, the election for president was a direct result of, not a popular vote, but elections for the state legislature, where the electors would be decided, with the most votes originating from New York City. Here, in an area land known as Greenwich Village today, lawyer and budding national figure Aaron Burr took charge of the anti-Adams, anti-Hamilton Republicans in New York. Jefferson and others were watching to see if their party could survive as a national party outside of the southern section. Burr had created a professional political machine in the city, broke the city into districts, and had committees and subcommittees that would survey house to house, go to each home and determine if the voter was Federalist or Republican. Did they need more persuasion? Should they be ignored? Are they a person that we've got to remind to vote when the time comes? The previous year, he had founded the Manhattan Company, a bank so that businesses could now openly side with Republicans and not be spurned by the banks, many of which were controlled by Federalist politicians. He assembled a good ticket, too, with known personalities, including General Horatio Gates running for assembly, the victor of Saratoga, Governor George Clinton. He allowed his house to be a nonstop center of operations. The Republicans won those elections in May 1800, which meant that the electors would be for Jefferson. It was already known this early in the year that Jefferson would win New York. And Burr earned himself a second nomination for vice president. Already, before the election of 1800 was even started, a nail was already in the coffin of President Adams. Adams blamed Hamilton for this defeat, though this one wasn't entirely his fault. These two events, the Federalist Caucus and the New York elections, drove Adams to the firing. Now it was war within the party. Theodore Sedgwick, Massachusetts congressman, elected Speaker of the House over the Federalist with Hamilton's backing, told Hamilton that there was every reason to believe that the firings that occurred were a peace deal between Jefferson and Adams. Still, Hamilton held to the agreement of the Federalist Caucus, asked Pickney to find any dirt before he left office. Pickney wrote back that he had attended to, but was thrown out too quickly. Stick with the plan. The electors would still vote for both people, Adams and Pickney, and the South Carolina would make Coatsworth Pickney president. As Thomas Pickney had said, party lines are faint in Carolina. Both parties were active here now. Pickney was the Federalist VP candidate, but another, Charles Pickney, or CP, was the leader of the Republicans in the state. In effect, Hamilton's strategy was do it England, where South Carolina is England. But that just wasn't enough for Hamilton. He wrote a pamphlet attacking the president. It was intended just to hurt Adams in South Carolina and to stay there. It attacked his conduct during the revolution, said Adams wanted to pursue a silly idea of annual terms for soldiers that would have been a disaster. He said that he had extreme temper, said that he had great intrinsic deficits, which made him unfit for office, that John Jay really negotiated peace with Britain, not Adams, and many other negative things. Well, Republicans got a hold of this letter, this pamphlet, and printed it in their newspapers. Adams found out, of course, was furious. Hamilton should have been embarrassed, but instead he decided, well, instead of letting the Republicans out my letter in their own newspapers, I'll publish it myself to make sure it's in its proper context. And that's what he did. So he now published a pamphlet against his own party's president. Despite all this, Adams also took some actions. 
He got a bill through Congress allowing him to disassemble the Provisional Army now that peace was being negotiated in, with France. The Provisional Army was not popular in America at the time, and he went from the old capital in 1800, Philadelphia, to the new federal city that was designed by and now named after the recently deceased leader of America, the city of Washington. Now, in doing this, he could have went to Quickway, but instead, the presidential carriage took its time, stopping in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, York, Pennsylvania, Frederick, Maryland, Baltimore, all to bands, banners, militia units, and cheering crowds. He expressed his gratitude and his confidence that the American people were prosperous now. It was a supreme moment for President Adams. Not since the Revolution had he been so much of a hero. It was also the first presidential election tour. Not called as such. He was just going to the new capital. That would help him win a few electors in Pennsylvania and Maryland. And he did come awfully close, despite the intraparty intrigue, to remaining in office. Yet in the 1800 election, New York and South Carolina would go for Jefferson depriving Adams of victory. The Pickney angle might have worked, but a few of Adams' supporters saw what was going on in Hamilton's plan, and they dropped votes from him to be sure that the Hamilton plot would not go through. Adams actually got one more vote than Pickney. Jefferson and Burvo, though, got the most votes. They actually tied. And with a message of democracy, a superior organization, they won the election. And he would not be the only candidate to benefit from a fight within the president's party. In 1912, the Democratic National Committee asked for a nice, elegant train car in order to transport their new candidate, Governor Woodrow Wilson of New Jersey, around the country. Something comfortable, something fast. Instead, they got the magnet, an old wooden clunker that proceeded slowly and needed to make frequent stops at many of these little stations across the country. Yet, as it would turn out, the magnet may have been a blessing in disguise. As you may know, Woodrow Wilson was plucked from the governor's office with just two years of political service. Before that, he was a college professor, erudite, learned, and he spoke as if he was giving a lecture. When he accepted the nomination, his speech was terse, long sections on policy, the tariff issue, the trust issue, and how legally it could be dealt with and how the way proposed by one of his two opponents, Theodore Roosevelt, could be problematic if one looked at the history of attempts to regulate corporations. In the middle, he might have sensed the mood of the crowd of well-wishers that perhaps they were dozing a bit, and he said, you may think that I'm wandering off into general disquestion that has little to do with the business at hand, but I am not. On he went about the need for free markets and agricultural and vocational education. He did manage to sneak in a sly attack on Theodore Roosevelt. In government, there is no indispensable men. As he rounded out his speech, the government will not go to pieces if any of the gentlemen who are seeking to be entrusted with its guidance should be left at home. Kind of a way of saying, it doesn't matter who you vote for as long as you vote. It's a nice sentiment, but maybe not the best message for a candidate. Yet, the blandness was partially part of the Wilson strategy in 1912. This was a campaign in which the Republican Party was split in two. Incumbent President Taft, the conservative side of the Republican Party, Theodore Roosevelt leading the progressive wing of the Republican Party in a third-party effort. As the Evening Herald said, referring to Theodore Roosevelt's speech and comparing it to Wilson's, after an earthquake, a small, still voice. The Atlanta Constitution, reliable Democratic organ at this time, saluted Wilson for not stirring up class animosities. The Boston Transcript, however, Republican paper, was less flattering. It called it a schoolmaster's talk. As the magnet shuttled around, it became clear that Wilson faced these two opponents, William Howard Taft, the incumbent president, and Theodore Roosevelt, the former president. But it was obvious that in reality... Taft had no chance of holding on to his seat, and the race could only be won by Wilson or Roosevelt. So he attacked the former Rough Rider and Bull Moose candidate harder 
than the incumbent. In fact, he was relatively easing, uh, easy on the incumbent doing a search of his speeches in 1912. One finds few references to Taft, and the two did meet, shake hands, and exchange a joke about losing their voice in the middle of the general election campaign. As his train pulled up in a town with anti-Taft Democrats who were attacking the president, he would tell them not to attack the integrity or patriotism of the man in the White House. Something else happened. The old train required frequent stops, and at each stop, as word spread that a presidential candidate was in town, a crowd would form. Speech was required with the crowd, and Wilson had to give more speeches than he might have planned. Matinee speeches, they were called. In Columbus, Ohio, he just gave a quick biography, as he had little prepared to say. In Longsport, Indiana, he repeated his attack on the third party's policy on trust, how by regulations they would make the trust a legalized institution of the country in partnership with the government, and this could not be allowed. In Sioux City, Iowa, he said he would not engage in personalities. Persons seem insignificant compared to the interest of this great country. It was all very abstract, but as the magnet took him to more crowds, as he spoke more, he gained confidence and figured out how to connect better. In Minneapolis, he gave his speech extra prep time. It's necessary in speech to strike out straight, strike on hard from the shoulder, Winston said. More like one of his Princeton football players than the president of Princeton College. He spoke about trust in small business now in understandable terms. Any man can get behind the place where he's a little and get big, where either survives or gets bought up. But he's got to get past the stage where he's little, Wilson said. Sometimes he needs credit and can't get it. He continued on with one newspaper describing his speech as hypnotic. Human rights should come before property rights. Men are cheap and machinery is dear. And you'll hear of superintendents being dismissed for using up a machine, but not a man. In Detroit, he continued his more conversational style. When you invent something, you need money. Well, you might as well whistle for it, though. You won't get it. The pygmy hasn't any chance in America. Only the giant has. And the laws leave the giant free to trample the pygmy. Roosevelt and Wilson attacked each other as they traveled. Roosevelt proposed reforms. Wilson tried to show Teddy was too radical. And that his reforms were not smart ones. That his party was a regular or a third party. This is always the way Wilson referred to Roosevelt's party. He never used the term progressive. He didn't want to salute him. We are not for fighting the trust, Wilson said. We want to make them equal under the law. We don't want commissions to regulate industry. That would make government experts in charge of the industries. In some ways, Wilson was more conservative than the Roosevelt campaign, though he tried to stay with a bit of a progressive message. Wilson had supported initiative and referendum, and as a candidate, continued to advocate for this, a national initiative and referendum, kind of like the propositions that California had. We We don't have this in America today. It was not successful. Everything culminated in a dramatic speech in Madison Square Garden. The day before, Theodore Roosevelt had spoken in there and reportedly got a 50-minute standing ovation. Now, when Woodrow Wilson was announced by Senator Oscar Underwood of Alabama, the next president of the United States, cheers, applause, shouts of Woody, Woody, filled the hall for 70 minutes. 20 more minutes than Roosevelt got. There was excitement to the Wilson campaign. They knew they were winning. His 435 electoral vote win would be impressive. Yet it was obviously the result of the split between the GOP. Roosevelt earned 88 electoral votes, Taft just eight. Wilson took New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, and Wisconsin, which had been out of the Democrats' hands for 20 years. He also took Ohio, Iowa, and Maine, which had been Republican for 60 years. Yet in combined popular votes, there was a danger sign. Wilson's GOP opponents earned a majority of the country. With socialists earning 6%, Wilson became president with just 42% of the popular vote. That leads to a question. Did Wilson also win the election but lose the campaign? Did Wilson even matter? What if Democrats had backed one of the other people they were considering, like Beauchamp Clark, the Speaker of the House, or William Jennings Bryan? Could any Democrat with a unified party have beaten Taft in that year? Wilson supporters argued in the nomination contest that their man could bring credibility to the ticket. Western progressives liked that he took on the bosses in New Jersey, that he acted like a progressive. But Eastern conservatives found his association with Princeton and the establishment to be to their liking. This and a little home state advantage in New Jersey, which can bleed over into New York, might have assisted with the win more than those two other candidates. 
Maybe Boke Champ Clark could have alienated progressives. Maybe William Jennings Bryan would have scared Easterners. Still, with a 22-25% split in most of those solid GOP states, perhaps any Democratic challenger would have won. As you can see, we are looking at presidents who failed to win re-election and the challengers who faced them, the circumstances of the election, and what those challengers did. A few more deserve attention. In 1888, Grover Cleveland lost re-election, though he won the popular vote. Quarrels with Democratic bosses, particularly Tammany Hall in New York, he didn't give them enough appointments, he didn't pass the legislation they wanted to see. Indiana, other states were decisive in Cleveland's loss. He had Democratic papers at the time blasting it. He wasn't considered a real Democrat at that time. There was a lack of enthusiasm in the party. In 1892, Benjamin Harrison, who had defeated Cleveland in the 1888 election, became president without an electoral college win. Now, as he was running for re-election in 1892, there had been a small recession in his term in 1890 and 91. During his president, there was a lot of labor strife, particularly Homestead, Pennsylvania, uh, the steel company there. He was not popular in his own party. He faced the kind of apathy that Cleveland had four years earlier. He also faced a third-party challenge, Populist Party, which stole votes in Western states. Definitely heard him in Indiana. The uh, Populist Party would end up getting 8% of the popular vote. And Cleveland was back in office, the only president to do so after having been defeated. In 1828, there was a similar rematch between John Quincy Adams, who was facing off with General Andrew Jackson, the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. See, president Adams, though, was only president not because of the Electoral College and not because of the popular vote, only because of a vote of the House of Representatives. Jackson had actually obtained more popular votes and more electoral votes than Adams in the 1824 election. His presidency was not a disaster, but John Quincy Adams achieved little of his goals, and by the midterm elections, he had a hostile Congress who were supporting the Jackson. Two years before the election, John Quincy Adams wrote in his own diary that he would lose and Mr. Jackson will be elected. Well, he was right. Jacksonians got and the support of John Calhoun uh, from South Carolina, who was serving as Adams' pre vice president, joined the Jacksonian side. They united the South with the Democrats in the North, organized in Pennsylvania, formed hickory clubs all over the country, and many, many newspapers supporting Jackson all over the country. Adams and his ally Henry Clay tried to start a pro-president opposition. In the end, he got about the same amount of electoral votes, all coming from New England, same that he got in 1824. In fact, one vote less. As Jacksonians took the reign of power that was denied to them in 1824. Okay, we've looked at enough re-election defeats in history, I believe, to start labeling and classifying things here. I think there are two reasons incumbents lose. The first, economic reasons. That's fairly easy to determine in most cases, right? 1840, the bank ruins, the business ruins. 1932, the Great Depression. 1980, stagflation and the misery index, all Carter's problems. 1992, a recession, maybe not as strong, but still strong enough in most voters' minds. When the economy is actually in recession during the election year, the president so far in history is toast. Of course, we didn't always measure uh, economic, but you do have panics and you can see business failures and bank failures and how much money is out there and things like that. With the exception of 1992, all of these were obvious prima facie economic crises and you knew the president was in trouble. The second is a bit tougher, but in some cases it's just as plainly obvious. A president loses re-election when they lose their party, when their party is split. 1976, Reagan Ford, 1912, Taft Roosevelt, 1888 with Cleveland and the Democratic bosses, 1892 Harrison and his own weak party support. There were people who wanted either McKinley or Blaine to take the nomination from him. They only weakly nominated him with a lot of votes at the convention outside the incumbent. He also had a populist challenge. 1800, the fight between Adams and Hamilton. That accounts fairly easily between the economics and intraparty fighting for 9 out of 10 of these failed re-election attempts. And the one, 1828, is something of the joker in the deck. 
where Adams never won the popular vote in the first place. Jacksonians just took back what could be said to be rightly theirs. Once we do this taxonomy and classification, though, you'll see that it's more complex, as there are mixtures of causes for any election law. 1932, you had a bad economy, but you also had a third-party challenge. The president had two opponents to face. 1840 was an economic-based decision of the electorate, to be sure, but Van Buren also had political party problems. I put 1980 in the category of an economic decision. Carter also had a severe intra-party challenge from Ted Kennedy. And so there can be a mixture of factors, but you know, usually one is a bit stronger. When you look at these elections, and from the point of view of the incumbent alone, right, we're not even talking about challengers here, you see the factors of success or defeat just from the side. Some of these defeats were plainly obvious. Everyone knew the president would lose in the election year. They didn't all write in the diary like John Quincy Adams. When a president's going to lose, very often you know it. This would lead to the question, as I now shift the camera over to the other side of the election, the challenger, what does the challenger do and does the challenger matter? If everything is based on whether the incumbent has intra-party support and whether the economy is good, does the challenger even matter? Could they do absolutely nothing and win? That's kind of a silly question because we know no one, especially in these modern times, will do that. They won't lock themselves in a room after they get the nomination of one of America's two political parties. Challenging candidates will always be active campaigners, whether they're extremely good at it or not. You know, this was true in the old days as well. Jefferson didn't campaign, but oversaw through his letter writing an army of organizers around the country that built organizations. William Henry Harrison made his stump speeches, and the Whig Party developed its propaganda campaign. His grandson, Benjamin, had a superior organization. Matthew Quay, senator of Pennsylvania and Republican boss, helped win New York from President Cleveland, exploiting the weakness of the fragile coalition between Tammany Hall and the president who was always seeking too many reforms for them, the divided Democrats. They took New York in the election of 1888. But in 1892, Cleveland's United Democratic Party took New York back. Jacksonians spent four years building their clubs and opposing the president. Wilson ran a persuasive progressive campaign with a bold idea of a national initiative and referendum while trying to clip Roosevelt's wings and presenting him as too radical to lead. Franklin Roosevelt promised a new deal. As a symbol of his energy, he flew to Chicago and accepted the nomination of his party in person. A surprise, the first time ever. Carter focused on his honesty versus the Ford administration's pardon of Nixon. He focused on his native son appeal to a South that had drifted away from Democrats in the past two elections. Reagan performed flawlessly in painting a contrast between he and the weakened incumbent. Clinton ran an organized message focused on the economic pain Americans were experiencing. Nobody who ran for president and taking on the incumbent president who won did so unaware that the man in the Oval was a serious threat. They all took actions and ran organized campaigns with different levels of ability. Yet there were a few close elections that didn't work out for challengers. 1916 and 1948 were an incumbent predicted to lose, perhaps, didn't. That might be a clue there. One thing that links those two candidates, those challenging candidates of 16 and 48, is a challenger who tried to evade the public, tried to avoid stances. So I'm somewhat agnostic about challengers. I think re-elections are a referendum on the president. Yet that's tempered by the history too. A challenger could blow it. Carter almost did, it appears, in 1976. A challenger at least needs to keep things going, keep momentum, avoid scandal, obviously, avoid those gaffes, and keep focus on the incumbent and not on to themselves as much as possible. A challenger, we should say, has to appear presidential. Yet how do they do that? They're not in command of an army. They're not in command of the White House. Well, their speeches, their performance in the debate, their choice of the vice president is, is seen now as a... But most importantly, I believe their command over the one group they can command. A challenger speaks volumes when they get their party unified. A challenging candidate who has the party in lockstep will be seen by voters as someone who will arrive in Washington with the ability to make changes. It's the one group right now that the challenger can be leader of, his own party. So by God, he ought to do that well. The conventions of 1976... Carter's campaign, Reagan's campaign in 1980, Clinton's in 1992, used those events to demonstrate that their candidates were leaders of the party. 
though it did not guarantee that in office that leadership would continue at all, but it presented it for the election year. So unified party check, have to have it. A confident image and a strong message doesn't appear to hurt. A vision is not going to be the reason that a challenger is elected, right? It's going to be that incumbent president's performance, but it makes the campaign attractive to voters. Maybe it throws off a potential third-party effort. If you're not saying enough, there might be a third party that is out there willing to say it. So you want to avoid that. We are kidding ourselves. We really think, though, that it's all about the challenging party's message, that Whigs got voters to whistle and sing them into the presidency, or if it was Clinton telling them that he felt their pain that got voters to pull the lever, rather than the pain they were feeling itself that did it. I would go this far. No challenger has ever won an American election. Only a president has lost an American election. Okay, there's 1828, but I said that's the joker of the deck. Challengers can't lead opposing armies. They can't create diplomatic snafus for the White House. They can't bring the GDP down. Challengers themselves can't directly fell a president. The challenger's job is, however, and I think Romney's job in the upcoming election, is to create a rhetorical home for the otherwise mixed feelings of disappointment about an incumbent. They run in place, in a sense, waiting for their opening. It appears to be better if they run well. The best challengers go beyond just finding things wrong with the president, although they certainly do that. They create a rhetorical White House of their own, act as if they are already president, present a confident vision and a message that can be understood, even perhaps a few pieces of legislation they will enact. Time will tell if Mitt Romney joins Jefferson, Jackson, the two Harrisons, Cleveland, Wilson, Roosevelt, Carter, Reagan, and Clinton. The ten very different men who, with very different approaches in different situations, took the White House in the rarest way possible, beating a sitting president. A good convention, solid VP pick, debate performance will be critical. He has one advantage. He defeated his primary opponents decisively to gain the nomination faster than most commentators predicted that he would. This cannot be dismissed, especially because... Romney ostensibly comes from the moderate wing of his party, the George H.W. Bush side, if you will, the Bakers, the Strollcrofts, the Powell, Pataki, Christie, that side of the party. So I think that's an achievement. So the more that he shows uh, complete control over his party at that convention, that's going to be to his advantage. During the next few months, voters will determine if he can assume the presidency during the campaign or whether they will go with what has to be considered the default of American history, electing the person who's there president again. I want to thank you for listening. The website is www.myhistorycanbeatupyourpolitics.com. We've got a Facebook site. You can talk. We've got the archives available, $14.99. I always say it won't be the same price forever. And if you do like the program, please uh, let somebody know about it. A comment on iTunes is always helpful or on your own blog. Always helps to spread the word. Thanks for listening.